You're listening to Saturday Morning Media. And now, back to our show. Under the Puppet is made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who support the show over at patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media. Welcome to Under the Puppet, the show that talks to professional puppeteers about the art and business of puppetry with the sole purpose of helping you up your puppet game. My name is Grandpa Choco, and this is Under the Puppet. This episode, we have an interview with a puppeteer who has lived the dream of creating not one, but two shows based on his puppet characters. Dan Milano is the creator and puppeteer of Greg the Bunny and Warren the Ape, and it was my pleasure to sit down with Dan for this interview. Dan Milano, welcome to Under the Puppet. Thank it you, is Grant. great to have you here. I'm excited to talk to you about a lot of things. Um, but the first thing I want to ask is, do you remember your first exposure to the world of puppetry? Uh, yes, without a doubt. It was absolutely Sesame Street. And, you know, Sesame Street was a part of my life for so long that I, th- I kept watching it long after I would have theoretically outgrown it just because I was I felt so close to those characters. And particularly, I mean, I was fascinated with all of it, but when I saw kids like myself or younger talking to um, Harry Monster or Grover, you know, with those, like, simple backdrops they'd do and a little brick wall set, and the kids were clearly not scripted. Somehow, even at a young age, I knew that this was just a very real moment that was happening because it just sounded natural to me. Mm -hmm. Um, That That's what I wanted. I just wanted to meet them and very quickly even as young as I think four or five I knew that like well to make that happen I just would put one on and talk to them like you know that that was just this instant gratification yeah and did you did you have puppets or did you did mom and dad buy you a puppet or did you make them or I I I did have one puppet um that was a Steiff rabbit from the German antique company Steiff and um it had it had a very woodland appearance, a very like true animalistic appearance. It wasn't sort of stylized or cartoony, mm-hmm. and it had a, it just had enough room for an index finger for the head and your pinky and thumb for the arms. And um, I didn't like it very much because it had a, it was wooden in the neck. It was a very folksy. You know, I had no idea this was like a precious handcrafted thing. I just thought it's not very muppety, and therefore I don't like it. So I kept it at the bottom of a um, toy box, and I instead just got all the Fisher-Price Muppets that I could get my hands on, and uh, those became constant companions. There's photos of me as a child where I'm rarely seen without a puppet, you know, in the shot because they were like my security blanket. But um, the funny, the reason I went into such detail about that rabbit is that, uh, I don't know, 18 years later, we were doing my friends and I, a public access show in New York, Mm -hmm. and we found an old ratty puppet bunny that I put on and did some improv with, and that became the first iteration of a character that became Greg the Bunny, which was a show I later, um, you know, did a few uh, incarnations of. But, oh, my God, I did not realize it for about two years But when I looked at the bunny, it was so threadbare and it had button eyes and all this stuff. I, something was familiar about it. And when I went back home to my house on Long Island, I was living in Manhattan at the time, and I dug out some old stuff because my family was moving. I found that old wooden bunny. It was the same bunny, (laughs) except that the the one that I had come into contact with through a good friend of mine um, as a found item was all worn out, and I yeah. had this pristine one, and they both had the little stife button, so it was like a predestined thing. That like before, I can even remember, I had the puppet that would be Greg the Bunny. It was so weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted. To, I, we're going to talk about uh, Greg the Bunny, and uh, I actually want to ask you about your public access show, Junk Tape. Um, but before we get to that, I want when you when you had these. Uh, the Muppets, and you were running around with it. Did you put on shows, or was it just you were just talking to them? Or I would put on um, albums, like record albums of like the Muppet movie soundtrack, and I had a big um, wall length uh, mirror in my behind the door in my bedroom, and I would sit on the bed, and I would hold up the puppets, and I would lip sync to the albums, and just incessantly, and mm-hmm. built up what I realize now was a lot of muscle memory. Yeah. Um, in my hands 
but at the time I was just trying to like bring the Muppet experience home. I would even have like Kermit on my arm and I would with scotch tape affix a little ukulele to him and then I would have like Fozzie on my other hand and um you know I'd I'd position something in front of him like bongos so he'd be on the drums and then I would actually put like Rolf the dog on my left foot and Animal on my right foot so that I was just in the middle of this giant Muppet band I was just trying to recreate the Muppet band Mm -hmm. I used one of those old uh um Fisher Price projector containers which were like big cylinders as like a snare drum for Animal and and that's what I did all day. My mom would just walk in, <laughs> smile, and back out. And then eventually I just wore the puppet everywhere. And um, I didn't put on shows. Like, I was never an exhibitionist about it. But I would, and this is kind of creepy, I guess, in a way. <laughs> if my parents had friends over, I would just walk around with Kermit nestled in my arm. And I would make a point of just having him look around. Like, I could be having a completely separate conversation, but I would keep him alive. Mm-hmm. And that was something that was pointed out early on to me as like uncanny. Yeah, you know, like my parents' friends were definitely like, <laughs> "What are you doing? He seems so real." And I'd be like, "He is real." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I read this, and you know, the th- things you read on the internet—they're always one hundred percent true. But you have no f- other than what you've just described. No formal puppet training. No, I, I, my only training was in. I did go to school for uh, film and television studies, and I took formal like film and TV programs. And um, but I just was self-taught as far as the muscle memory I learned doing lip sync and performing as a child, and those were talents that. I didn't think of his talents. They were just my very young hobbies that I kept up until I was about 12. And then around that same age, I got a video camera, uh, like a VHS camera, and I began making movies. And some of them had puppets, but most of them didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't until deep into my college education at NYU that I employed puppets sometimes in productions or, or other people found out that I had this talent and then made me feel you know, accepted and said, oh, would you do a puppet in my production? And, you know, and that sort of opened up something that I had sort of closed off for quite a few years Mm -hmm. because I literally put away childish things in a way when I became more like 13, 14. I just didn't, I liked the Muppets, but I didn't have the puppets as part of my life. I rediscovered them in college. Yeah. And was like, oh, yeah, I love this. Yeah. You know. In in college when you were doing those things, did did you ever build them? Uh, the puppets, or was it all somebody else built them? I repurposed. Repurposed. Um, I would occasionally design puppets that others would build uh, with, you know, sketches, but I wasn't somebody who went and got the fleece and flocked it and all that kind of thing. Um, I, in fact, I still go to folks like Drew Massey if I need a puppet. <laughs> like, um, I would, we got a lot of our characters f- used from, like, Goodwill as stuffed animals, and then we would, like, put new eyes on and cut the mouth out of something, make a puppet out of a doll, right. things like that. Um, but no, I was never a builder. Yeah. Uh, in a way, too, I think it's because I was so fascinated with the Muppets, they were already made for me. And I saw nothing sacrilegious about becoming Kermit. You know, and just, like, bringing Kermit home and making him mine and just, you know, having my own experience with him. But I certainly didn't uh, want to build Kermit. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And when it came to my original characters, I just sort of found them. Yeah. You know, improvisationally and almost literally, like, physically found them more than sort of uh, made a blueprint. Yeah. Um, well, I want to talk to uh, – we mentioned uh, Junk Tape before, which is the public access show yeah. that, you, that you did. Um, and was the creation of that show – and that's the show where kind of Greg the Bunny uh, was the host of the show yeah. or, you know, a host of the show or, you know. Um, but was that – did you guys do that um, – because you were tired of kind of waiting around for something else that you're like, hey, let's just do a show. That's exactly right. I mean, we had graduated NYU, um, myself and my friends, um, Chris Burgosh and Sean Baker and Spencer Shinoy, and we were really in love with stuff we were seeing um, at Luna Lounge Comedy Space in New York and also at um, um, sh- with shows like Mr. Show with Bob and David. And we knew there was a public access uh it's no longer, but, you know, in New York, you could go to a studio there and you can actually get airtime. Or you could send in pre-made video cassettes that would air 
as long as they had uh, obeyed certain decency standards, they'd air just about anything. Yeah. And Sean Baker would always say, we got to do something. So we just started improvising, and we were all too scared to appear ourselves. We were, like, all very camera shy. So I think Sean or Spencer said, you should, you should put a puppet on, you know? And we found this bunny puppet that my friend Chris Bergash had acquired, and, you know, we threw him on and started talking, and then that character took over the show and became, you know, several years of workshopping of Greg the Bunny. Yeah. What do you, what do you think are the benefits of... Uh, kind of producing your own thing like you did with public access or now for people who have the internet. What do you think the benefits of that are? I think it's absolutely necessary because it is it is time for you to hone your skills on every level. Um, whether you're trying to break into voiceover, puppetry, animation, um, or just plain old acting, uh, cinematography, anything, the DIY approach now more than ever is important. But I think it's equally important to really find the people in your life that you um, share a sense of collaboration with because the trap I think some people fall into is wanting to be the auteur. Mm -hmm. And although I respect, you know, um, people's artistic uh, abilities to be an auteur, like I I just think that the greatest creators I know, it all came from a collaboration because then you're learning from other people and you're, you're, um, assisting one another and you're sort of sharing and learning and building it up together and that's where you really hone it um but taking the time to 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 do your own show is amazing because yeah you just the way you build that muscle memory in front of the mirror you're building production experience based on your successes and failures of just how to make a functional practical you know uh show experience yeah and then when you add maybe when you seek out um more professional education, you, you still have a very strong frame of reference going in, you know, and you can just right. apply it to your what methods you're already using. Yeah. Well, and the, um, you know, as we mentioned, uh, Greg the Bunny kind of came out of that show, or he came, he came from there. Yeah, the character did. The character did, yeah. And then I saw on uh, YouTube that there was like a pitch tape, like you, you kind of cut down the best of or, or whatever of junk tape. Yeah, and we made like a sizzle reel. A sizzle reel, yeah. Did that... Did that lead to Greg the Bunny getting a show or it, getting something? It did. Um, we we had had a really positive response from people who would call the like two one two number where we had a voicemail and say encouraging things. Plus, whether they did that or not, we were having a blast. Yeah. And this was in the um, this was in like the late mid to late nineties when independent film was really starting to boon in Manhattan and in L A. And we had friends who were at the Independent Film Channel, which was a brand new channel. They weren't good friends. They were more like acquaintances. Spencer Chenoy's brother, Kevin Chenoy, who, who produced a great deal of the Greg the Bunny content, he, um, uh, he knew some folks there, including um, this woman, uh, Allison Palmer Bork, who um, was looking at the time for somebody to sort of be the uh, host for the show or like a, an icon in, in a sense. And so he set up a screening for us to show a couple episodes at uh, a local theater. And so we actually screened our episodes for friends and for some folks from IFC. And during that time, we also made a sizzle reel just for them with Greg literally begging for a job, right. you know, saying, like, um, all the things that we were really going through. You know, it's just like, I'm cold and I'm tired and, and Chinese food is expensive and I want to quit my day job and I want to have a show. And so they were tickled by it and they said... Hey, we like we love this guy. Um, would you like to be our spokes bunny for the <laughs> network? And we were arrogant enough to say like, nah, that we, you know, not really. Uh, we'd like our own show. Can you do that? Which was so ignorant and like we should have been like, yes, thank you, anything. Right. But we were like, nah, this is pretty special to us. We don't really just want it to be your logo, which was a good decision for them more than us. Like <laughs> that would have been ridiculous. But uh, they responded negotiating they just said well we we can't offer a full show but like why don't you just do some interstitials for us just do like little short films that celebrate indie film you know Mm -hmm. and maybe do some trivia segments for us at the end of each film we show we'd like some trivia and we invented the war in the ape character to be the you know the person who would deliver the trivia to the to the audience because greg was was too silly of a character to, to take things like that seriously um, and then we aired, gosh, we made easily a um, hundred short films for IFC before we were um, 
eventually we got the opportunity to come to L.A. and sell the, the show, uh, a pitch of the show to the Fox network. Yeah. Um, but IFC gave us that, like, sort of, like, kind of a hip underground sense of the character, and the channel was very popular here in Los Angeles. Well, and what a great way to also develop the characters if they give a hundred, you know, like if you're doing a hundred of these things yeah. that you got to do, you could really develop uh, the things over time and, and make them solid characters for when you do make that pitch. If you if you love something and you're not doing it just to like win that lottery or win that pot at the poker table, if you just like love cards and that's why you're at the table, then you do become a better poker player or you do become better at whatever you're doing because you truly love it. You're sort of unable not to do it and you get all that time in. And I think that there are several points in my life where I realize, yeah, whether it was the little kid in front of the mirror or whether it was an, an exceptionally long development period on a project I'm now working on that was frustrating at the time, like that it was taking so long, but the project is so much richer and so much better for the time put in. So in whatever you're doing, if you're able to, you know, just come at something again and again and again, you're going to learn a tremendous amount. And if you love it, you're always going to have fun, whether it works out or not. Yeah. You know, and I think that's in a way why we were a little cocky with IFC. It's like, well, we love this and it's great and we want to keep having fun. So we only want to work with you if we can keep having fun, you know, like, right. don't take the fun away. We <laughs> right. love it too much. Yeah. You know, yeah. we didn't articulate it that way, but looking back, I think that's kind of how it felt. Yeah. Well, I want to, um, you mentioned that, you know, uh, Greg the Bunny started on IFC and then it went to Fox yeah. and then it went back to IFC, right? Yeah. Um, how do you think the character, just speaking from a character point of view, of Greg the Bunny evolved over that time? Well, at first, Greg, on, on the independent film, no, I'm sorry, on public access, we were just making ourselves laugh and we were imitating things we'd heard, like there were prank phone call uh, CDs going around by these guys called the Jerky Boys, mm -hmm. and they would have these like silly characters that would talk like this, and the original Greg the Bunny was more of a whispery sound, like I was just sort of making him derivative of things that I was enjoying at the time. But then the character started to defend himself more and his voice became a little more pointed and pinched. And on the independent film channel, that, that, that voice started to get a little more cute and everything. And then somehow, whether it's from my Long Island background or whatever, this kind of a Bugs Bunny thing got in there, you know, like, hiya, Doc, you know. And yeah. it wasn't strictly Greg the, the I mean, uh, Bugs Bunny, but... Greg sort of started to become a little more like he was from, you know, uh, Brooklyn or whatever. And that was just because we were a New York show, and I think I, I leaned that way. Um, but he was definitely a character who tried to stand up for himself more. But he had a, a kind of an abusive relation, relationship with the producers of the show who would appear almost like Peanuts, uh, like adults in Peanuts uh, shorts. <laughs> you would only right. see them from the head down. And they would interact with Greg off screen and sort of really antagonize him. And that, that made him this, like, underdog hero. And then on the Fox series, he was more a result, too, of, like, studio notes getting involved and people saying, like, he needs to be hipper and a little cooler. And, you know, we, maybe those buttons should be turned into blinking eyes so they're not so insectoid looking. And they really... Um, he really was, um, I guess, made more digestible for a, for a mainstream audience. And I have conflicted feelings about that, obviously. You know, it's it was a very special character to me. They all are. And it felt a little false at that time, even though Greg the Bunny on Fox, I think, is the version most people know, and a lot of people love it, including me. Mm -hmm. But um, it is, to me, a slightly warped version of the character as I knew him. Yeah. And um, Greg started out as also very manipulative and would do anything to be in Hollywood. Um, and he was a very needy character, whereas on Fox he was more well-adjusted. And I think eventually those qualities transferred over to War and the Ape, and he became the very desperate um, and sort of more debaucherous character. Uh, in fact, the spinoff of Greg the Bunny was done for MTV, and that was like all about War and the Ape pretty much. Yeah. Well, and it's funny that you, you brought up the the blinking eyes and stuff because my next question was that, um, you know, as we said, on Junk Tape and I, and I guess IFC, he didn't have a moving mouth. 
No. And then on Fox, he had a moving mouth. Was that, oh, we have a bigger budget, we can make a better pepper, or was that a note that that came down? It was, it like, was oh, a we... note, and we really wanted to do an episode about the note, <laughs> and they didn't let us do that at the time. But um, gr- the Steiff puppet that I mentioned had no moving mouth. It was that folksy, simple puppet. And we were fascinated at how much emotion we were able to convey over just the body language. Mm-hmm. And this is where... I actually took great inspiration from the Muppets because I would always watch what the Muppets were doing when they weren't talking. You know, and anyone who talks about acting usually says, you know, oh, acting is reacting. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I I didn't consciously appreciate that. But as a kid, I just noticed how Fozzie would wring his hat in his hands when he was nervous and when he was just listening to Kermit or how Piggy would fiddle with her hair. And so Greg... um, those little arms were so small they could reach up behind his bunny ears and he could scratch the back of his ear when he was talking and he could kind of sniffle. I'd rub his hand up under his nose and it would look like he was sniffling, you know, and it just brought so much life that we realized, oh, this is an asset. It's kind of this cool stylistic choice. It never, the body language would let him go from, in, in my humble opinion, from like happy to angry to sad and you'd swear his eyes were changing or that his mouth was moving, but it was just in the body. So Fox did not mess with it. On, on IFC, it was the same way. And when we went to Fox, we decided to uh, stay pure to button eyes and no mouth. But about six episodes in, they did some testing. And somebody somewhere was like, why does that thing have buttons on its head? And you know, they just were getting very nervous, and I've come to know that this is just always happens, particularly in, in the network space where people start to fiddle. Mm-hmm. And I'm actually, I believe, very strongly in collaboration um, and don't shy away from notes typically as a, as a writer or, or anything else. But, you know, you want them to be thoughtful. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't think it was very thoughtful. I thought it was more a mandate because I was trying to collaborate and say, well, let's do an episode where the network on Greg the Bunny finds Greg off-putting, so let's have him go get puppet plastic surgery. Like, th- this is a thematic thing to talk about. Do you alter yourself for success, or you stay true to who you are? He's a little small-town bunny. You're telling him he's got to get new eyeballs and, that, and a mouth. And we could do a hilarious episode about that, you know? Yeah. He could talk to a Lady Elaine from Mr. Rogers <laughs> and be like, Lady Elaine, I just, like, I just res- respect how, p- how pure you've always been. You never had a nose job, and you, you're no, like, you, no, you, you don't have a moving mouth, you know? And, like, but Lamb Chop will be just like, hey, man, we're all socks. You got you to gotta do it, kid, you know? Like, it would have been so fun. Yeah. But they just made the arbitrary, arbitrary change. And not only that, but they aired the episodes out of order. So... You know, one episode he had buttons, and the next episode he had blinking eyes, and it was just one of the many bizarre mysteries of Greg the Bunny. Yeah. I will say, though, if we take my personal preference out of it, that having a mech to move the mouth and wiggle his ears um, and blink his eyes with a, was pretty cool. You know, I mean, I did enjoy this new form of expression, and mm-hmm. I tried to lean into it and use it. Like, I wasn't begrudging about it. I thought, well, they're making me do it. I'm just going to... Going to go along with it. Yeah, and just try to make it great. And and it, he could do cool things, but he was a new character, and he was no longer my Greg, and um, that's okay. I was happy to share him. He was that Greg, and he's our Greg, mm-hmm. I'm including the audience in that. Anybody who's familiar with him, he's your Greg, you know. Yeah. But um, it, it was a very odd thing. Um, the Yek, mech was built by um, Scotty Johnson and... Um, he it was all in one one hand and had just these amazing pulleys and reactionary um, triggers and it was like a thing of beauty actually. Yeah, I was watching. I mean, I was watching clips right, you know, before the the interview and the range of like it's amazing, like how it works. Like I, I was sitting there trying to figure out like how does this all work because the ears are moving and the mouth is moving. Oh, yeah, and... my my in, my index and middle finger would control the ears and then my thumb did the mouth and my pinky could blink the eyes all on one hand a one-handed mech it was incredible yeah and it moved it had it flowed cleanly and that mouth like rarely got stuck Mm -hmm. um so the fact that it could i could move it that fast was great yeah and and uh, again that muscle memory uh helped because i think my hand like i had muscles that i could utilize for it so it didn't take me long to learn it which surprised me. 
When you were working on Greg the Bunny, were you using monitors? Or were you puppeteering to a monitor? Yeah, we and had, had like CRT monitors. And have did you have you had you done that before? Because you said you had no uh, you know official puppet training. What? Well, it began with the mirror, uh-huh. and then so I always had some sense of like working you watch against yourself. an image. Yeah. yeah, and then when we did the independent film channel show, we shot almost everything that wasn't you know obviously out on the street. We we shot stuff in my like studio apartment, and we had a cable that was just long enough to reach from the camera to like the front inputs on my TV. So I used to watch a monitor. When we'd shoot um, public access stuff or independent film channel stuff on the street, Sean Baker, who did the camera, um, who's got his film in con right now and who has won the Independent Spirit Award like two years over for his films, like he's just become an amazing filmmaker. He always was. Yeah. He, he was alive with Independent Spirit always. Um, Sean, I could run across the street with that puppet, not telling him what I was going to do, not rehearsing it. And he could frame out my arm and my shoulder. And I barely even have to squat or anything. I mean, he, it was incredible. He would use the frame and the zoom to cut me out. And if ever you caught a slight piece of me, we would either cut around it or eventually we, we would blow up the image a little mm-hmm. and, and had other tricks to sort of comp me out. But it was uncanny, his ability with that camera. Um, that he, I just felt safe to do pretty much anything, and he would keep me in the proscenium of the frame. Um, but yeah, so when we used though legitimate monitor setups on, on the Fox production, and we were working with uh, Chris Plord, who's our line producer, he had done Muppets Tonight. Um, m- most of the crew came from Muppets Tonight and um, and Dinosaurs, and I was in heaven because I had not one but two viewable monitors, and you know wherever I needed them, and sandbags, and apple boxes, and. Uh, on Greg the Bunny, the sets were, you know, four feet up from the ground, just mm-hmm. like they had done Muppets, and that was a first for me. It's like the first time I didn't have to just lie on my back, you know, or... But they did put me in dumpsters and sewers and, and, and other places <laughs> to get certain shots. Yeah. But yeah, it was great. Yeah. Um, I would love to ask, because we've, t- we've talked about Greg, but um, uh, two other characters. What was the, the inspiration for the character Warren the Ape? Where did he come from? Well, Warren came from a need for us to, to actually deliver information to the audience of Independent Film Channel. And, like, Greg was so silly and irreverent that he would never talk seriously about a movie if you asked him, like, have you seen... He was like a child. He, he grew from a child to an adult, I guess, over time. And the childish Greg... We'd be like, oh, I'm scared of movies. Like, and I, I, I'm not so sure I want to see like, you know, um, anything that's got Christopher Walken in it. Like, <laughs> like just silly nonsense. But Warren the Ape was who we originally saw as like almost a, a John Cleese character, like an uptight um, British character. And I, I just did a horrible attempt at an accent early on that we we kind of dropped. But he was more um, serious, and like, you know, he he showed up to do. Uh, legitimate work, and he was very frustrated with the fact that the bunny was being given any screen time because, you know, he's such a fool, and Warren came to deliver movie trivia, and so he would tell you everything you need to know, and this is important information, and then, again, those off-screen producers would just mess with him (laughs) and treat him like a puppet, and he brought, like, dignity. Like, the, the take on that character was, I'm not a puppet, I'm a fabricated American, you know, and right. I am. And we also thought about Orson Welles and how testy he would be. There was footage of him doing old wine commercials where he'd argue with the director. Yeah. So Warren was like that, like, you know, uh, I'm a thespian and, you know, I have a method and I would like to do this my way, you know, and that sort of thing. And it yeah. was just so different from Greg. Yeah. And then eventually he, we would put them in situations together, which was a doozy for me because I would literally wear them both at the same time. Greg on one hand and Warren on the other, because I didn't know other puppeteers in New York. Yeah. And we were so insular, my friends and I. I wanted to, but we never even really reached out or knew where to begin. So be like, hi, Warren. Hi, Greg. How are you today? Yeah, I'm okay. I wish I was better. Why do you wish you were better? You know, because eh, got to wish something. Like, and just, <laughs> oh my gosh, we would do that for hours, and it somehow worked. Yeah. Well, you know? I mean, you had all those years as a kid with animal on your foot and you know like doing all that stuff well, yeah i guess I, I i we the fact that they were now both talking almost almost overlapping was, yeah. was crazy it was like you know i'm no phil hendry but like 
it, it, I was shocked at like how smooth it was going. You just kind of go to this unconscious place where you're just making yourself laugh. That's what's great about any monitor is mm-hmm. that, frankly, I'm still just watching that mirror. Like, it's not me in the mirror. It's them. Yeah. And I know the feeling at Greg the Bunny was that even when they called the cut, I mean, we just kept the puppets up. Yeah. We'd keep them up almost literally all day except for lunch because we just didn't want the show to stop, and it was funny. So something about that um, adrenaline just makes weird magic happen. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. Well, and the other qu- character I wanted to ask you about, uh, the inspiration behind is Count Blah. Oh, yeah. Because he's a fun character. Um, well, Count Blah started because we just did this little – the movie Ed Wood had come out. And we loved the relationship between Ed Wood and Bella Lugosi. So on the Independent Film Channel, we were going to do a little short film to premiere in front of Ed Wood. So we did, we introduced this vampire character who was repurposed from a completely different puppet. And we put actual like novelty store fangs into this poor puppet that we had poked holes in its mouth and dressed it up like a vampire. And we had Greg love Count Blah. And we, were, we thought, oh, Count Blah is sort of like, Joe Flaherty's character on the old SCTV show, um, uh, Count Floyd. Yeah. And so Count Blah had a children's show somewhere once that Greg loved and admired him, but Blah was now old and retired. And, and on IFC, it was a little edgier than Fox. We, we also mimicked the fact that, you know, at the end of his career, unfortunately, like Bella Lugosi had, like, you know, some very serious addictions. So Greg brings Count Blah home and Count Blah raids the, the you know, his <laughs> medicine cabinet. Like, could I use the bathroom, Greg? You know, and, uh, and he, we have this clip of him going through the cabinet and going like, uh, ooh, Xanax, Blah, you know, like, <laughs> and that it was this reluctant paternal relationship between the old vampire and the young bunny. Yeah. And then as we developed the character um, in a couple more IFC shows and then brought him to Fox, we sort of kept that relationship but Blah lost his darker edge, you know. Um, and, and also, obviously, we were parodying the Sesame Street count, which I love so much. Right. Um, but this idea, Blah, that he would say Blah as an affectation Blah, after, like, everything he would say Blah was a, frankly, very weird choice Blah. And, but I loved dropping the Blahs <laughs> yeah. as punctuation. And so that aspect took over really quickly. And then... When we did the Fox show, I was already doing two characters, and if we added Count Blah, there was discussion of like, well, maybe someone should just fill in for you and you should dub it in post. And I was like, well, again, I like to collaborate. I was like, I want to share. Like, let's just audition people, let them do Count Blah, you know? I mean, so we met so many talented puppeteers in that process, and among them, um, Drew Massey and Victor Yared became part of the core cast. And Drew Massey took on Count Blah, and uh, although he would sometimes say blah instead of blah, <laughs> um, that became his version of the character. And, and it was like just the, the way Drew saw it. And I loved playing off him, and I, I was never like, oh, that's my character. You know, when we went back to IFC, I did play blah again, but that's because I had gone back to New York, and we just did it for like about a year. But to be honest, I missed Drew so much. Um, that when we did War in the Ape as his own series, we, we brought Drew back to be Count Blah because mm-hmm. I, I just wanted to, like, restore the, that relationship, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to, uh, before we started this interview, uh, you and I were chatting, uh, before we started rolling, about um, the commercial appeal of puppets and yeah. your your take on it. So I would love for, for you to get a chance here on tape to talk about, because um, you said uh, that... The thought kind of is it's got to be for kids or it's got to be for adults. That's it. Yeah, and, you know, we all need to break these rules. These are not, these are not rules that uh, I am imposing, and nor are they official rules, because I think the thing about art is, and commerce is that all these rules are made to be broken, right? And the best thing about anything in my career has been that I've been too naive to know these things, that I just wanted to go, hey, I want to make a puppet show on – Whatever it is, IFC or prime time, why not? Right. And then as you start to get more knowledgeable in the industry, you realize like, oh, there's a lot of reasons why certain things don't work. And, you know, you, you could become cynical. So I, I love that when people 
can just sort of trudge ahead in, with what they believe in. But it is worth saying, though, that I got a front seat window to how puppets are traditionally like marketed and how the industry views them. And it seems to me that, because I would always wonder, like many of your listeners, I'm sure, like, why aren't there more puppet shows? Where are all the puppet shows? Right. And it just seemed that, um, yes, the way you market is important because you want to do something that will be, uh, if you are just sort of, as most companies are, it's not even an evil thing. It's just obviously they want to make money back on their dollar. And with a show that's puppety or animation, they probably want to have toys and consumer products. And there are so many rules about when you can advertise and what you can advertise um, that that affects uh, how they want puppets to be seen. Um, I can be more specific to that, but I'll probably take it back a step to just say a more cleaner intro to that would be um, when we who love puppets see puppets, we see what we love. When people who don't have a preference, they're just a pure audience who's responding you know, to animation, live action, puppetry the same way, um, there is a sense because of Sesame Street that anything that features puppets might be preschool. And there are children who um, maybe are at an age when they're trying to watch the thing that older brother or older sister is watching that get self-conscious when puppets are on because they think, oh, that's baby stuff. I want to watch, you know, something edgier, Mm -hmm. you know, so they sometimes shy away. Um, So that would tell some networks like, like Fox to say, you know, in our case, they were like, well, we really love the edge you've got. You've got to play up that edge. Otherwise, people are going to think this is the Muppet Show and turn it off in the first minute or something. And I'm like, if they think it's the Muppet Show, why aren't they going to stay? Right. And they're like, well, this is a niche. Like, th- currently, this is a niche. And there was a time when that's how they felt about animation. Like, before the Flintstones, animation was something you saw in the local movie house. You didn't watch it on TV. And if you did, it was like early morning romper room Mickey Mouse Club stuff. Like, nobody had it on prime time to watch a cartoon. They seemed like they were young. And we didn't have anime, and we didn't have South Park and The Simpsons, and you know all those wonderful, subtle versions of animation had not been born. So, so too with puppets. I think puppets skewed very young before Henson made, um, you know, the, his Sex and Violence pilot. You know, there's a reason that Jim's original Muppet Show pilot was called Sex and Violence because he was fighting the same thing. He wanted yeah. to say this is not for children. Um, this is this is palatable satire for adults, and I want my art medium treated as something that can stand up next to like anything else you've got in that time slot. Um, but it's awkward because I think the recent Muppet Show sort of showed that that they took an approach of grounded reality and cynicism because that's they're trying to like find something new or try to find a mass appeal in it or a marketability that makes it new that like somehow people might find the the sweet down home innocence of them of the muppets off putting which is sad to me although i get it and i've done you know all the above you just want to hopefully let people express what they want to express without trying to like hammer it into a niche but you know that's why now it's less about what network wants or needs or what their advertisers think they want or the audience they feel they need to reach at huge percentages because that's what it's ultimately about you take something that maybe a niche loves and you want it to have the opportunity to go mainstream but they're too scared to stand behind something like that because it might not work so they want to hit that mainstream right away and they sort of dilute things Mm-hmm. Um, or, or risk to dilute them. I mean, we had very thoughtful notes at Fox and very good executives, but also when it came to the marketing, it was like double down on the darker stuff, avoid the lighter stuff. Um, and I always wanted the show to be, you know, sweet and salty. Um, but, you know, I, I think that now we aren't reliant just on network. We have Netflix and we have streaming portals and we have YouTube. And so people can do whatever they want. And theoretically, like, if it's good, you know, it'll find its audience. It'll get spread around. Um, Mystery Science Theater managed to do it. But, of course, 
it was a niche show. It was done out of love by someone who had a vision and didn't have to prove himself to anybody and got in on the ground floor with a network that needed content Mm -hmm. and created an institution. So there's a little bit of luck involved, too. I mean, IFC was that way. I don't think they were would have been looking for a show like ours. And I still don't know how Fox happened. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that we sold 13 episodes to Fox astounds me to this day. At best, it should have been just a pilot that probably never got aired. Yeah. You know? But um, Steve Levitan and Neil Moritz, uh, who were the showrunner and producer, um, they had a tremendous amount of pull at the time. And I think they just had a deal with Fox that, like, you need to air this. <laughs> like if you, we, it's pay or play. <laughs> so we were very fortunate in that they adopted the show and gave us that, that opportunity to learn. Yeah. You do a lot of voiceover work. Yeah. And do you think that is a sort of a good parallel career for a puppeteer to have as voiceover work as well? I absolutely do. I mean, I can only speak for myself, but like what I really love about puppetry is character. And although I do miss not having, you know... Um, like a physical avatar to manipulate, it is also sometimes a relief to just be in a booth and be on your feet. And um, I I really like to put my body into my performance. So if I am talking, I'm usually like really gesturing with my hands or I'm, I'm, I'm really being active if there's another actor in the room or sometimes a person in a, in the, at the mixing board I'll make eye contact and so I still feel connected as a performance it's not like all the physicality goes away and it's just you and your voice I mean you definitely can use your body Mm -hmm. I mean sometimes I think I'll even pantomime as if I'm wearing a puppet because it just kind of helps me get into a character Um, but you know I think the one most wonderful thing about puppetry is that you don't need anyone to interpret that voice you know they can look right at your hand, whether it's just your bare hand, you know, talking while you talk and gesturing, or whether it's like a, um, um, you know, a fully formed puppet, there's like a magic that happens in the instant delivery system. Like you bring magic into somebody's life because this uncanny thing, even though that they know it's attached to your arm, is suddenly in the room. And it's that feeling I got as a kid watching you know, those kids talk to the Muppets that, like, I think lives in everybody. Um, And that's the thing I think the studios maybe don't understand or trust is that whatever the tone of your show, I mean, people do, I think, respond and love to puppets on a very formative base level. And more than ever, I think audiences want and need to be in touch with, like, that inner child. And um, all I know is when we were shooting public access in New York, I could talk to addicts on the street in Washington Square Park and I could talk to Wall Street executives downtown and they all stopped and talked to Greg. Mm -hmm. I mean, with maybe one or two very rare exceptions, people locked eyes with the puppet and just talked to him. And this was often, you know, just walking up with the camera running. And it's like amazing. And, and, like people just smile you know and just have a conversation so that's like incredible i think that's part of the success of avenue q is they sort of proved like we don't have to hide it's it's okay yeah it's just a stylistic choice that we're not hiding you know i went on the howard stern show and um he loves puppets i found out when i was there but i was pretty scared to go in and the attitude was like Oh, uh, you're gonna be you're gonna make us pretend that the puppet's real and we gotta talk to the puppet. And I was I was like, no, you could look at me. And I had Greg just be like, I brought my puppeteer. He's here. You know, like I just you don't need to make a separation between puppeteer and and puppet. I would often see Jim Henson appear on the Tonight Show or something, and he'd sit down next to Kermit. And you just you just accept and believe that both can exist at the same time. My parents showed me the coffee table book of Muppets and Men, the making mm-hmm. of the Muppet Show, when I was about six years old. And I remember my mom saying, if this upsets you, we, you, we can take it away. Because they thought, oh, what's, how's he going to react to seeing they're not real and people with their hands in them? And I was like, oh, no, that's, that's Jim Henson and that's Kermit. Yeah. And in my mind, Jim Henson is real. He manipulates Kermit. And Kermit's real. He's Jim's friend. Like, no question in my mind. Hmm. And, and that 
sort of carries through. And I think a lot of people feel that way, whether they can articulate it or not. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think every once in a while you get to someone who is like just refuses to look at the puppet. They're just going to look at you, you know. But, yeah. those, but those are few and far between. A lot of times you can get somebody just to focus on the puppet. It's true. I mean, I, there were occasional people when we were shooting junk tape who wouldn't, would want to look at me to like say, oh, your, your trick's not working. But I swear like in the conversation, most of them would disarm. I also yeah. would, was very good at like just putting him in front of my face <laughs> right. so that they had to. Right. Um, because I think when people see, too, that you're not trying to um, – again, it's that vulnerability. If, if I do have a childish reaction, some people callous up like, oh, I don't like that. Like I'm an adult and I don't want to go to that place. Yeah. And um, even if you're, you know, your conversation is not at all trying to be you know, youthful. But um, I, I think that once they see you're just there to talk and the tone of our show was always not like, how are you, little boy? But just like, what's up, man? What yeah. you doing? You going to work? Yeah. And then they're kind of relieved, and then <laughs> most of them lightened up. Yeah, I think one of the funniest things in the in the junk tape sizzle reel is when Greg goes up. I, I assume it's a van full of New York police officers, you know, and like you just kind of come and like you can just tell like they're all kind of sitting there, and you guys just walked up to them, and but they all have like this smirk on their face. Like, yeah, we're cops, but this is. Kind of funny. Yeah, know? they didn't make us shut the camera off. Yeah. And that was that was like kind of our dare in a way. <laughs> yeah. It's really, really funny how, how people would react. And that was the typical of like how, how people would behave. Yeah. Um, who is your favorite puppet character that is not your own puppet character? Uh, lovable furry old Grover. You know, Grover. yeah. I love Grover. I do grow like I try to talk like Grover for my nephew when I read her books and stuff. Even though I do a very poor Frank, but I just Grover is me. <laughs> like I love him so. Even in print, those old golden books where there'd be like a monster at the end of the book, yeah. and uh, that Grover was so silly and sweet and open. I mean, the s- sketches he did with Madeline Kahn. You know, I think Frank is, and I love Frank and. Jim and all these wonderful puppeteers of all, you know, a skill set and type and gender. But, like, Frank Oz has this, like, vulnerability in his characters that makes me so choked up. Like, I, I, uh, I just felt so safe with Grover, you know. And so to this day, I think he's absolutely one of my favorite puppet characters. Yeah. And I felt the same kind of love for Fozzie Bear. Um and I know, like, I'd love to have some alternative choice that's, like, not doesn't have to be a Muppet. <laughs> but, man, those Muppets, they, they're why I'm here or anywhere. Yeah. I just knew, I knew immediately that not only did I love this, but, like, I wanted this in my life. This is going to be part of my life now, you know? Yeah. And now, who is your favorite public character that is your own? <sighs> it is very tough. I'm partial to the, the Wumpus, who is, like, a sort of an rarely known character who's more in our IFC stuff, but I came to love War and the Apes so much because Greg the Bunny was always a little one note and very silly and you know, that's no one's fault but my own. But with Warren I just pictured this rich inner life and I and I loved again his vulnerability. To me, Warren is somebody who demands dignity but also deserves it. And just because he was born, you know, fabric with googly eyes, like he's been sort of passed over, you know, and not taken seriously for the roles he would want to have. And um, is just such a desperate, so desperate for attention and to be loved. I mean, I always loved characters like that. I loved Eugene Levy's characters on SCTV. They were always like sweet and misunderstood and awkward. And I also loved... Um, um, there was this wonderful show on HBO called The Cub- Comeback with Lisa Kudrow. And mm-hmm. her, her, it was like a follow reality show about a star who wanted to recapture the limelight and, and was just so desperate. And so putting that desperation in Warren made me really love him. And, it, and when we did a show all about Warren, it was also about addiction. And we worked with Dr. Drew Pinsky and we put Warren in therapy and we tried to give him a show where he's – trying to clean up his life after the fallout of the Fox show having been canceled. We did about 12 episodes of that, and 
the, my favorite thing about it, although we didn't really get to explore it fully, was that, you know, he was just so vulnerable and wounded, and that's why he drank and did debaucherous things. Um, and that he just could never, though, see to correct those things about himself. Um, and that he was sort of tra- trapped in that body. So it's a tragic character, you know? And that was fun to play because mm-hmm. I was doing a lot of silly stuff. And I actually saw Warren as kind of like a, um, you know, a more dimensional role, you know, and somebody who wasn't just like funny because he was a, a a silly monkey, you know, or whatever. He was, he had an inner life. Yeah. Well, you, um, you know, uh, we, we talked that you, uh, you know, we're on the Howard Stern show and you've done all these like great things in your career. What has been the highlight of your puppetry career so far? (sighs) Well, I've gotten to do some really amazing things. I never would have thought like I, I hosted like MTV red carpet stuff with Greg the bunny and like all these like uh, amazing, like celebrities would come up and talk to the, the puppet. And I did Howard Stern and I, I, you know, I've, I, I once t- got to uh, have Greg the Bunny met Steven Spielberg when, <laughs> at the at the Amblin Ranch when I was there for a meeting, and we just had Greg with us, and like all these great little moments. But those are more like anecdotal, like little little pinch. I can't believe I'm here moments. But the thing that is resonates deepest with me was when the Fox Show was being made, and we were doing the pilot. They had built the full set for the children's show. In, in Greg the Bunny, which we called Sweet Knuckle Junction, and it was just this beautiful Technicolor set. And I just remember laying down on the stage floor um, after hours with the lights still on and just, like, looking up at it and just laying there and thinking, like, they built this. Like, we, we dreamed this and they built it. Yeah. And it was made of all these Technicolor flats, and it reminded me very much of even the those flats you saw at the end of the Muppet movie, you know? And... Um, I just thought, like, I, I can't believe it, you know. It, it was just my favorite moment because I thought, yeah, all that playing in front of the mirror, no matter how this goes, like, we got here. It is a dream factory. It is a magic store. It is, like, you're picking your banjo in the swamp and just doing what you do. And you you do just meet other people. And you connect with them. And then eventually you get this shot, maybe, maybe. And if you do, it's a very special, unique thing, and it made me happy. Um, I don't think I really understood what the Muppet movie was about until I was in my early 30s because I had this magic store experience at Fox. At the end of the Muppet movie, the music gets very scary because things start falling apart. And it wasn't just cute pratfall, like, "Uh uh-oh, we banged into something ways. Like, things were really crumbling. And I remember, as a child, being very scared and, and not understanding, like, why is this all happening? I thought they got their dream. And then, you know, at the end, the roof opens and the rainbow comes in and they sing. And then I was like, oh, I feel better now. That's a really cool wide shot with a lot of Muppets, so now I'm happy. But I always remember thinking, like, oh, I don't like the ending of the Muppet movie because it got weird. Mm. So then, you know, Fox show gets canceled. Uh, other projects I do, all of them so fun and delightful and crazy, all get canceled or end naturally or whatever. And so as an adult, I started to realize like, oh, yeah, because that movie's not about the rich and famous contract and it's not about the the 2D version of what brought them all together. Like it wasn't about that production. It fell apart because they all do. Whether they're canceled or they go 10 seasons, they all end. The rainbow connection is the the Muppets, the relationships and, like, I've taken that so to heart, and that's how I come to every production now. And it really took the pressure off me, too, of trying to make every project some kind of enormous win or, you know, again, like a, a poker pot that you're trying to, like, bluff your way to get. It's just about, hey, this could end tomorrow. Right. We're having a great time. Yeah. And so that... Even though I didn't feel that way at the time, I think I was sort of subconsciously appreciating that. Just the fact that I'd been on that set and they built it and it hadn't fallen down yet. <laughs> and I was just so happy to be there. Yeah. You know, and now I'm just sort of, um, it's a cheesy line, but I'm literally happy to be anywhere. And um, it's just about the, 
the other Muppets you meet, you know, and what whatever wacky s- skill set they bring and to your banjo music, you know, and you just form a band. Yeah. Well, Dan, um, it's been so great talking to you. If people want to check you out online, where can they uh, follow you or check you out? Um, I have a Twitter account I don't use very often, but I'm uh, at Dan Milano. And, um, you know, I'm working for Nickelodeon uh, right now, and we have a show called Glitch Text, which will be coming out in about a year or so. And at that time, there'll be a lot of uh, presence for that show as well. But, like, I'm, I'm on Facebook, and we used to maintain a website for Greg the Bunny specifically. Um, but, you know, um, I don't think we have that current right now. I should check it out. But we do have Facebook pages that I curate from time to time for the show. A lot of fans have reached out and found me. Okay. You know, and, um, and I'm always really, like, uh, encouraging of that. You know, people send me art and people sometimes, like, exchange emails and conversations. So it's been, you know, a good experience, you know, hearing from people who like the show. Excellent. Well, I will put links to some of that stuff in the show notes. Thank you. And thank you so much for talking to me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. This is wonderful. I appreciate that you've been, um, you know, talking about this with so many people because I'm fascinated, you know, and there's so much, like, I want to know about, you know, what my contemporaries experience because I, I came up in such a unique way that I still see myself as very much on the outside looking in when it comes to puppetry, even though I've worked with a few of these people, um, you know, so thank you. It's really cool that you're exploring this niche, oh, you know, and making pleasure. it relevant. You're the perfect example of like how, you know, we just got to pick it up and do it. <laughs> you know, if you don't see the show you wanted, just make it. <laughs> well, thank you for agreeing to do it with me. Yes, my pleasure. As weird as that sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Thanks. You can connect with Dan Milano via Twitter, where his username is at Dan Milano. And for a direct link to that and more, visit the entry for this episode, episode number eight, over at underthepuppet.com. Thank you to Dan for being on the show. Also, special thanks to Audrey Gray for making this interview possible. To wrap up this episode, I want to talk about the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, Georgia. A visit to the Center for Puppetry Arts should be on the bucket list of every puppeteer. It is an amazing place to see different puppets from all around the world. It also houses an amazing collection that serves as a tribute to the works of Jim Henson. On top of that, the center offers educational programs, regular live performances, and much more. If you've been, you know. If you haven't been, find a way to get there. I'd also recommend planning a trip to the center that coincides with Dragon Con, the science fiction convention that takes place every Labor Day in Atlanta. Dragon Con has a puppetry track that features panel discussions, workshops, and a wildly popular puppet slam. Making plans to visit the Center for Puppetry Arts around Dragon Con is a puppetry one-two punch that'll inspire you for a long time afterwards. Information on the Center for Puppetry Arts can be found at puppet.org, and info on the Dragon Con puppetry track can be found at puppetry.dragoncon.org. Direct links to both the Center for Puppetry Arts and the Dragon Con puppetry track can be found in the show notes for this episode. Once again, that's episode number eight over at underthepuppet.com. And finally, I want to send out a special thank you to Apple Podcast user Just Puppets for the wonderful review that they left for this show over in the Apple Podcast iTunes directory. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is much appreciated. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Under the Puppet. I welcome your feedback via email at hello at saturdaymorningmedia.com or via Twitter, where the show's username is Under the Puppet. You can also like us on Facebook by searching Under the Puppet for our Facebook page. I want to hear your suggestions for questions I should be asking and for future guests. Also, the goal of this show is to talk to puppeteers making it happen in all sorts of styles of puppetry. So if you know an amazing Boon Raku or shadow puppet artist, please reach out. Let me know who I should be talking to. Thank you so much for listening. Talk to you next time right here on Under the Puppet. Under the Puppet is a production of Saturday Morning Media and is made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who've gone to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up a monthly donation for as little as a dollar a month. Huge thanks to Shay Stewart, Mer Lafferty, Jeff Peterson, Dale Gadania, Stephen Staver, Jackie Climo, Melissa Crawford, Dave Slusher of the Evil Genius Chronicles, Mike Coughlin, Dorothy Bachoco, John D, Kathy Crawford, Brian Greer, Carrie Whitney, Chuck Tomasi from the Technorama Podcast, Chris Foster, Stephen Ng, Clinton of ComedyForecast.com, Vicky DeVries, Mike Wabshaw, Twitter user Butts and Gear, aka Wildcat, Eve Cunning, Mike Hamilton, Gaston Moreno, 
Reed Loveland, Ivan Asquith, Vanessa Whitney, Janine Lee, Peggy Etra, Kristen Hogan of Squid Friends, David Akers, Zoe Palladino, Ellen Multari, Christopher Harris, Rachel Jackson of Vox Fabuli Puppets, Carolyn Wisner, John Petty, Rachel Hansen, and Darcy Prevost. If you'd like to support this show and the other fun content from Saturday Morning Media, become a patron. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up your monthly donation today. You can also tell a friend about the show or just like Just Puppets did, leave us a review in the iTunes Apple Podcast Directory. Under the Puppet is copyright 2017 Saturday Morning Media Grant Pachoco Executive Producer. All rights reserved. www.saturdaymorningmedia.com You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. <laughs>